Okay. Randy one, Randy two. Randy one. Randy. <laughs> yeah, computer list. Well, I want to start out this morning by just thanking uh, this church, but especially thanking Russell and the elders of this church for the privilege of uh, standing in this pulpit. But I want to point out to you that our sermon today started as soon as the clock hit past midnight. I hope your worship began before you got here as well. And I want to thank the Lord for giving us such a wonderful sermon that started just in the last few nights. The clouds, the lightning, the thunder, the storm that is him. Because that's exactly what we're going to see in Scripture today. That that is a part of his sermon. His continual calling us to himself. At times, some people, and perhaps, perhaps some of us, we, we feel that God isn't saying much to us. We struggle with feeling like maybe he doesn't even care. He just seems so distant. Um, we just feel like he really isn't trying to touch bases with us. And maybe you've thought, thought something like this, you know, Lord, won't you just say something? Won't you just talk to me? Can't you just give me something? Can you write me a letter or a note or something to help me know what I'm supposed to do? To help me know how to navigate this journey called life on earth? Well, we're going to look this morning, and go ahead and turn to it if you would. We're going to look into Psalm 19 this morning. And the reason is because God has spoken, it tells us, and God is continuing to speak, and he will continually, constantly, and forever speak to each one of us individually. Both with and without words. And I, I had to ask myself, you know, well, God, why? Why would this be true? Why would you speak to us and communicate to us? And I have to come back to what we all know is true. But maybe it's not so true as it should be in our lives. And that is, and that, is that God loves us. I don't know if you realize it, but God loves you more than anything. Part of his creation. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you grew up, it doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done, it doesn't matter how you feel about yourself or what others feel about you. God loves you. And I don't think any of us, even on the other side of war, is going to fully understand. But that's what motivates him. That's what motivates him to speak to us constantly and continually. It's because he loves us. He wants to be in fellowship with us because that's what we were created for. We were created to be in relationship with God, our creator. And with him, more so than with anyone or anything else. You've heard it said, in every human heart, there is a God-shaped void. As the Bible tells us, that void is filled only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. While sometimes we may be asking, God, just say something, talk to me, I, I, I need to hear from you. I wonder how often God is 
answering back and saying, Randy, your name, why aren't you listening to me? It's true. God is continually calling us. Just listen to this. Would you stand with me as we read Psalm 19? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man, running his course with joy. It's rising. It's from the end of the heaven. And it's circuit to the end of the earth. And there is nothing hidden from his feet. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord, it's clean. Enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant born. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous or willful sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my These are the very words of God. David says the heavens are declaring, the heavens are preaching. They are spewing forth. They are overflowing with is the terminology that is uh, used here in the Hebrew. They are pouring forth what? Rain. Yeah. But all throughout this world, every day, constantly, continually, God's creation. And here, David just focuses on the, 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 the skies, the heavens and the skies. He was a shepherd. He was probably, you know, spending hundreds, if not thousands of days out alone or with just another shepherd or two watching the sheep. And, and he spends the night there and he sees the starry skies and then he sees the beautiful sunrises in the morning. And I can just see him contemplating and thinking about that. And, and maybe one morning right after the sun begins to rise, he starts to write this song, inspired words. Moved by God, he penned this. Noting that creation, he refers to the skies, and only the skies and the heavens. But it's not just that creation, it's all of creation that speaks forth the glory of God. As a part of my testimony, it wasn't the revelation in the skies of the stars, although I knew a lot about that, and it's unfathomable when you start to consider all of that. And with all the information we have through our technology and everything, we, we have all these stats, we just know how vast and 
can't. I mean, it's almost infinite what's out there. Not crazy. But that's not what led me to believe in God. That was a part of it, I'm sure. But I was a biology major. And when I began to study the human body, physiology, and I don't want to go into all the details, but that can just happen. There's a designer. There is a designer to creation. There is a creator. And even though our creation is now marred, and we don't get to see the full glory of creation because of the sin, after the fall, creation was cursed. And we don't see the full glory. But even so, it's so marvelous and so wonderful. There's no doubt there's a creator. And I knew. I knew. I didn't know Jesus. But I knew he was Now, we know that mankind has, from the beginning, at least after the fall, wonder who's up there. Is there someone out there? What's out in all this expanse? And and as we you know we, we develop the microscope and all that, we can look with the most powerful microscopes and we can see single atoms and everything. And man's just curious and wondering, what about all that? We have tremendous technology, tremendous telescopes and microscopes. But we don't need that to know that there's a God. But I want to tell you about one particular uh, pastor mentioned last week about West Virginia and how Mother's Day was started in a, a small church, Methodist church in West Virginia. Well, I want to tell you about something else in West, West Virginia. And that is uh, in Green Bank, Bank, West Virginia, there is the largest radio telescope in the world. In the dish alone, you could put 60,000 stadium seats. It stands 485 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. And even in the outskirts of outer space, it can pick up the sound of what would be equivalent to one snowflake dropping on this pole. The people in West Bank, or uh, uh, Green Bank, excuse me. They can have no Wi-Fi, no television, no radios. It's against the law to have anything that might interfere with that radio telescope. For miles around, those things are there. One of the workers from Green Bank uh, Radio Telescope was interviewed recently, and he began he said, you know, you begin to ask yourself, where did the sun and the stars and all this come from? And, and then you begin to wonder, where did I come from? And I thought, you know, that's interesting. Those are great questions. He's studying, studying the skies, which is exactly what Psalm 19 is talking about. And he's doing exactly what it's supposed to do to people. He's asking the question. What does all this mean? God says it means you can know, you can see, you can see the designer who created all this and know that there's a God. In verse two, we see that the God of creation is calling out to us con uh, constantly, continually. In verse 3, the revelation of God is primarily visual, more so than verbal. In verse 4, we see that it is universal, available to all people everywhere. And then in, in verse 5, now catch this, verse 5, what does it talk about? The bright room and the strong one. And we see that discovering God's glory through his creation is a delight. It brings joy. 
my son, my oldest son, is getting married in less than two weeks now. Probably the happiest day of his life. talking about God's glory as seen through the sun. He doesn't know how to describe it, so he uses two illustrations to try and convey it. The other one is a strong runner running his course. <clears throat> one of the reasons I ever got into ministry is because of the movie, which some of you may be familiar with, Chariots of Fire, about Eric Litter, Little, a runner. He had a very uncharacteristic style of running. He pumped his arms, you know, like pistons, and his head was back, and he had this grin on his face as he was running. Why? Because he was made to run, and he forewent the mission field so he could go to the Olympics and run, because it's for the glory of God. And that's what I think of when I read this. The runner. Running. We discover the glory of God through creation. It's a glorious thing. It's a joyful thing. It's one of the happiest things of your life. One of the greatest joy-filled experiences in the world. And I got to tell you, just briefly, I mean, studying this passage over the last week or so, um, this changed when it comes to nature and, and, and God's and I've had some encounters with him just through his creation to a degree that I have rarely felt before. I hope he will take advantage of that sermon and that declaration, that continual speaking to you through creation. Not just the heavens above, but even the most minutest aspect of God's creation. Well, God makes it clear even without our scientific technology of this day, even back in David's day when they didn't have all that, he makes it clear that creation alone is enough to hold man accountable for the knowledge of God, a creator. And I want to just prove that to you. Um, I'm not going to prove it to you. I'm going to let Scripture prove it to you. As I read some passages out of uh, Romans chapter 1, chapter 2. I'm going to be turning to Romans 1, verse 18, and just uh, skipping around a little bit. And uh, the last two verses I'm going to read are from chapter 2, uh, verses 14 and 15. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not that they don't see it. It's not that they don't get exposed to it, but they suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. God has created us with a knowledge of a creator, that we are the creature and there is a creator. It's plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Notice. It doesn't say clearly proclaim. Communication isn't just proclaiming. There has to be a reception of what's proclaimed, and it's received, it's perceived, God's telling us. Ever since the creation of the world, and I'm going to skip through, but several times he said, God gives them over. Over to what? To their sin and their their desires to replace God with someone or something else, usually self. I want to be on the throne. I don't need God. Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. What's that saying? There's something in man, in man's nature, that he knows right from wrong. There's a moral law that is inbred in us. There's a knowledge of God that is inbred in us. But it's our sin. Trying to justify our sin 
that leads us to hide from God and to suppress the truth about God so that we can cover up our sin and feel good about ourselves instead of doing it God's way. That's the pucket perversion of, of this, okay, the summary. There's more to be said, but we don't have time. Okay. The revelation of God in the world through creation, therefore, Romans 1 and 2 tells us, is sufficient to condemn all of us. Period. God says it, it's true. But, it doesn't stop there. Because God's revelation isn't just through a creation that gives us a knowledge of God and because all men tend to suppress the truth all men fall short of the glory of God and, and all men stand condemned. He also gives us, because he loves us and he knows you know, that we have a problem, even though we're created to know him, we reject that. So he reaches out to us still in other ways. To what is referred to by theologians as specific or special revelation. The word. The Bible. The scripture. The written word, and we're not really looking at it today, but also the living word, Jesus Christ himself. So we may say, God, say something, but God says, I am, I am. Why aren't you listening? I want you to imagine the thickness. Now, I know some of you don't have Bibles. You use all those electronic contraptions and whatever. But I want you to imagine the thickness of one of the pages of my Bible. Okay, put your thinking cap on. I want you to imagine it's 93 uh, million miles thick. Not whatever it is, but imagine it's 93 miles thick. That's the distance from here to the sun. Okay? So imagine that this page, one page, represents that 93 million miles, the distance from Earth to the sun. The distance to the nearest star would if we're using this scale, would be 71 feet. So to get from my page of my Bible to the nearest star would be 71 feet. The diameter of our galaxy alone, which is 100 light years, that's how far it takes to travel that diameter, that would be the equivalent of 310 miles. Okay. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is this. The diameter of our galaxy is 310 miles. The edge of the currently known universe, and I say currently known because we're making new discoveries about what God's created all the time. The edge of the known universe would be 31 million miles. That says something about our Creator, doesn't it? Wow. The glory of God. Man. We must be one. Let's go back to Psalms 19. Verses 7 through 11 is where I want to pick it up now. We've made that transition now from the God of creation, of revelation through his creation, now to specific revelation, specifically here through the word of God. Verses 7, 8, and 9, there are six statements or stanzas, if you will, about Scripture. Each stanza has three parts to it. There are six titles for the word. There are six characteristics or attributes of the word. And there are six benefits or results from the word of God as it works in our lives if we let it, if we'll expose ourselves to it. It's a big yeah. I want you to notice that for each of those six statements, every single one of them says, of the Lord, 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 of the Lord. Six times God's trying to make a point. It's his word. It's of the Lord. Therefore, we should listen. 
you should care about it. You shouldn't dismiss it. His point is the Bible is indeed the very word of God. It is without error. It's complete. It has everything we need for life and godliness. Indeed, the word of God is his special revelation. I'll say to us, but I want you to realize that in reality, it's his special revelation. I like to look at my Bible as God's love letter. So much. He said, Randy, I can understand. I can imagine Tim and Diane, and my son, and God said, you know, I don't know if they write notes to each other anymore. They're probably dead. I don't know. Twitter and Facebook and all that. I, I don't even have Facebook. I just want you to know I am so blank. That's why I don't see anything up on the screens. I, I have trouble clicking that. Actually, I have trouble clicking on the other side to cliff. But, uh, um, you know, I can imagine that they said some nice things to each other, about each other. I bet they kind of do those over and over again. Okay. Well, that's kind of how I like to ask. I said, I love you, man. You're good. You tell me how much. You tell me everything you know about me. I want you to know how to live your life. Special creation. I love you. Cherish that. Cherish that. Well, we don't have time to look at all the different aspects of the Word of God. That's probably what we're most familiar with. But we've, we've heard a lot of those things already. And I'm not passing over them because they're unimportant, but we, we read them. And they're fairly obvious. There's different connotations to them, but. The point is that God's word is totally sufficient. It's the power, it has the power of God to transform each and every life. It has the power to make us wise, to give us joy, to provide complete righteousness. It is eternally relevant. It is absolute truth. If someone says it isn't, if someone says something contradictory to this, I'm going here. This is what I'm saying. I call this God. And I know this is His word. If you've ever thought, I wish I had something I could. Uh, go to in every circumstance, in every situation, and know that it was absolutely uh, relevant. This is the book. This is the book for you. It's the most valuable. David moves on in uh, the psalm, and he says, the Bible is the most valuable and desirable book of all. He says, the words of this book are more desirable than gold, yea, much fine gold. What's he saying? It's more valuable than the greatest treasure I could ever find and discover. And it's sweeter than the honey, than the drippings of the honeycomb. It's the sweetest, most tasteful, most pleasurable thing that you can think of. That's the word of God. It's also a book of warning, he says. It helps keep us on track. It help keep, helps keep us in relationship with our God. It helps us live as a testimony to Him. And I had this thought, and this really wasn't a part of the sermon, but so much more I want to be able to say, but you know, Russell was only just an hour and a half, so I don't have time to get it all in. He did tell you that. Did he? We, we get out at one today? Okay. Um, 
I, I had this thought, and I've never had it before. I don't think it's heresy, I think it's true. Every single one of us is created, right? So what did he say about creation? He declared the glory of God. My life is declared the glory of God. When you know, when doctors, I, I have some things. Our family's had a lot of medical issues. Recently. So doctors have been sticking their shoulders, you know, radiating and all this stuff, and looking at us. And, you know, you know what they're seeing? The glory of God. You know what else I'm created for? Through how I live my life, through my words, what I say. So my team is me. I'm a part of that, both parts of it. I'm not the inerrant word of God, but I'm supposed to be a testimony. And that's what a part of the word is, is a testimony, declaring God's glory and other things as well. Anyway, no charge on that one. Um, it's a book of warning. It's also a book of great reward. But only if we use it. Only if we let it get into our lives. And treat it. That's so God speaks in creation. God speaks through the world. God speaks through Scripture, through the Word. But He also speaks through those things to our soul. He says, Who can discern His error? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous or willful sins. Let them not have the meaning of them. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So David looks up to the stars. Wow. Amazing. He looks into the word of God. Wow. Also amazing. Awesome. Then he looks at himself. Yuck! That's broken. He realizes it's broken. See, God's word, especially, has a way of showing who we really are. We fall. Even if we lose it, we're still. A Savior. Thank God He continues to forgive us. Christ died on the cross for sins past, present, and yes, even future. Praise God. David's final response, very well known, verse 14, that the words of my mouth meditation of my heart. He's essentially saying, let my life. I mean, that's his worship, that's who he is, that's what he's about. He said, let that be acceptable in your sight. He's using terminology of, of a sacrifice. Presenting himself as a sacrifice on the altar of God. Oh, Lord. Not my accuser. Not my judge. But who? My rock. Debbie and I recently went to Dallas. She she drove up there because <clears throat> I had to work and she wanted to leave earlier than I could, so she drove up there and then I flew. But we drove back together and <clears throat> noticed one thing as we were driving. We were listening to the, I think it was Caleb, one of the Christian stations or whatever based out of Dallas. And as we kept getting further and further away, the signal kept getting weaker and weaker and weaker. We kept getting static and 
we kept trying to switch to the San Antonio K Love, you know, and that wasn't there. And, and uh, found that, you know, if you're listening to a radio station and if you're listening to a ball game or whatever it is, I used to have to travel to Lubbock. All three of my boys have gone to Texas Tech and Lubbock, six hour drive, you know. I can remember trying to catch ball games, football games, driving back on a Sunday, you know, trying to tune into all that. Well, you know, if you've got a station and, and you start driving, eventually it's going to start getting weak and you start getting you know, static. And then sometimes you get another station that cuts in. And, and uh, so that, you know, that happened to us on our trip. And you know, I thought about it. And, you know, what would we do if we wanted to, to hear that station and couldn't pick up the San Antonio one? If we really needed to listen to that or wanted to, what would be the best way to do so? Well, we'd have to turn the car around and, and head toward the signal if it was that important. If it was that important. So that is what God. God's communicating with you. He loves you. He knows you need him. He knows that he's the one that can fulfill your life to the fullest like nothing and no one else. You were created for him. I was created for him. He's continually, constantly, through all of creation, and there's so much more we can say, you know, the, the, the general revelation includes our conscience. You know, that's a part of what he speaks through, that moral, natural law that, you know, by nature we know. I mean, he, God loves us so much, he's got multiple communication sources. He's got Facebook, Twitter, whatever all those things are. I don't know. Um, but when the signals start getting weak, you have to turn around and head towards them when you start drifting away. The theological term is You've heard the saying, if you feel far from God, who moved? Not him. He's reaching out no matter what. He sees all that filth in your life. Paid him. He's paid for that. He's taking care of that. He loves you. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be a father to you. All those other different ways of describing the relationship. There was a preacher who was in the pulpit one day. And there were two little girls in the very back, laughing and complaining. You know. He suddenly stops in the middle of his sermon. Now, they're so far in the back that almost no one in the congregation can see them. And he yells, There are two people in this service who haven't heard a word I have said. It's quiet, including those two little girls. Well, he goes out back like Pastor Joy often do out in the foyer and after the service. There were several groups of people that came up to him and apologized <laughs> for having fallen asleep or whatever it was. I'm sorry, Pastor. You see, it doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what God is saying to you this morning. Now, he may be using you, but ultimately, it's God's sermon. Whether it was as you were driving in, I had a glorious time just looking at the, the sky this morning, the, the, the clouds and the different layers, and then some sun and blue. And it, it was gorgeous. I worship before I got there. But God's speaking. Constantly, not just right now. What's important is are you catching it? Is God, I would say, up there? Is He up there saying, Randy, aren't you listening? I wish you would. Did you see what I did for you this morning? Don't you see what I've, don't you remember my love letter? So, 
miss what God is saying. Don't get distracted. Don't lose your priority. Don't ignore or fall asleep at his feet. Listen. Tune in. God's station is always available. He doesn't move. He's constantly broadcasting. He has no power surges. He never falls asleep. He loves you so much. He's constantly calling. He wants to know you intimately. He wants you to spend time with him. He wants you to know him. And yes, he wants you to help make him know him. He wants you to read. He wants you to study. And yes, he even wants you to meditate on him. Why? Because it alone is all that you need to live a fulfilled life in God's will and become more like the Son of Jesus Christ. It transforms. Hebrews 4.12 says, the scriptures are alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the deepest areas of our life. Why? To expose us and judge us and throw us in hell? No! To change us so we can enjoy life and the abundant life he wants us to have, not when we get in heaven, but here and now. One of my goals, I don't know how well I'm doing with it, but I've often said, you know, Lord, I don't want you to have to change me much when I get to heaven. I want to see change here. Change unto Christ. Christ like me. So what is God saying? He's saying that I look up to the skies. Wow. Look how awesome he is. Hear that thunder. Look at the stars. And look at the, the sun. He says, I look at the word. That's even more amazing, more awesome. I look at my own soul. I see my need to truly hear from God. So sometimes I have to turn that calling down. says, draw near to God. He will draw near and come on your way. Maybe today that you're hearing God signal clearly. It's loud and clear. You're in tune with God. The lines of communication are strong. But maybe for some of us, we've kind of drifted. Drifted away. We're in some static. Hopefully it's not just completely white static. Turn around. That's always the case. Constantly. 